Hello, dear friends, and welcome to this new Bible study series that's entitled The Bible on One Foot. Now, the first thing that may be occurring to you is uh, why would anybody call a Bible study The Bible on One Foot? It's kind of a weird name for a Bible study. Let me uh, share something with you, which will uh, give you some idea of uh, where I came up with this uh, name. Uh, a famous account in the Talmud, and the Talmud really is a uh, written record of what the Jewish people call the oral law. And uh, in that book, in the Talmud, uh, there's the story of a young Gentile who desired to convert to Judaism. This was not a rare occurrence, but this particular Gentile stated that he would only convert to Judaism if the rabbi could teach him the entire Torah. The Torah is uh, what the uh, Jewish people call the first five books of the Bible. It's also known as the Law of Moses. So this Gentile said he would only convert to Judaism if the rabbi could teach him the entire Torah, the five books of Moses, while he, the prospective convert, stood on one foot. Uh, the young Gentile went first to the famous Rabbi Shammai who, insulted by the ridiculous request, thrust the young man from his house. The young Gentile did not give up, but went this time to the equally famous Rabbi Hillel. This, gent this gentle sage accepted the challenge and replied, whatever is hateful to you, do not do to your neighbor. He went on to say, this is the entire Torah. All the rest is commentary. So he told the young Gentile, now go and study it. Go study the Bible. Interestingly, in Matthew 7, verse 12, part of the Sermon on the Mount, we hear Yeshua the Nazarene uh, saying very similar words. Therefore, he said, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Law and the prophets being a kind of a summary way of talking about um, about the Bible. So Jesus, or Yeshua, uh, kind of puts the positive spin on it. Uh, Rabbi Hillel put the negative spin on it. But the idea is that um, uh, the Bible can be summarized uh, in a way that is um, edifying and uh, beneficial uh, to people. So we are going to be going through the whole Bible in kind of a summary, uh, summary manner. And uh, for the rest of this uh, presentation, this introduction to the Bible on one foot, uh, we will do some uh, basic studying of the Bible itself. Now, before we actually get into the material, let me share a little bit about uh, myself with you. Uh, which hopefully will uh, give me a little bit of credibility uh, with you and um, um, maybe give you some appreciation that I, um, I, I think I am in a position to be sharing a, at least a summary approach to the Bible uh, with you. <clears throat> I became a believer in Yeshua or Jesus Christ uh, back in 1980 when I was serving out on the west coast of, um, uh, of this country, America, uh, serving in the Marine Corps. I was stationed at Marine Corps Air Station El Toro, uh, flying the uh, F-4 Phantom, a um, uh, fighter attack uh, aircraft. And during the three years that I spent uh, out in Southern California, um, uh, I, I found myself caught up in uh, what in those days uh, was called the Jesus uh, Movement. Uh, my wife and I lived in close proximity to uh, Calvary Chapel, um, uh, in Costa Mesa, uh, California, um, the uh, first uh, of a uh, kind of a franchise of uh, Christian Calvary Chapel uh, network of uh, churches. And we were also close to uh, John Wimber's uh, first vineyard uh, church that also grew into a uh, kind of a franchise, almost a denomination of uh, churches, although both of those uh, uh, both of those churches uh, prefer to refer to themselves as non-denominational, so I don't want to uh, insult them. Um, in that environment, I uh, be, uh, became a believer by uh, reading a uh, Bible that I had given to my wife as a wedding present 
Um, when we got married, I was not a uh, believer, but uh, she challenged me to uh, read the Bible that I had given her. And uh, because we were newlyweds, I was willing to do about whatever she uh, requested me to do. So I began reading the Bible. And I got to the um, uh, point where the uh, Old Testament was telling the story of David, uh, who later became King David. And um, uh, I found myself believing the things that I was reading. It took me that long <laughs> to, uh, to allow the Holy Spirit to kind of sink in and create faith in my heart. And uh, I have never looked back. Um, knowing myself as I did at that time, I thought it might be kind of a passing fancy and then I would grow bored with it probably pretty quickly and, uh, and uh, you know, get interested and pursue uh, something else. But uh, that never happened. And in fact, uh, in uh, about the two years that remained in my uh, military time, uh, I um, uh, grew in my faith. I found myself under the um, kind of teaching and discipleship of uh, a number of uh, wonderful pastors and uh, Bible teachers. And uh, I grew in my faith to the point where I thought uh, that I was ready to abandon the career in military aviation that I had been, uh, aviation that I had been pursuing and uh, decided to uh, get out of the military and go to seminary and see if I could become a pastor. Uh, so I did that. Uh, uh, graduated from a, a denominational uh, seminary and uh, served um, uh, three different uh, churches uh, during the 31 years that I was uh, in pastoral uh, ministry. Um, I retired uh, recently in uh, 2018 uh, to pursue some of my interests uh, during my uh, time in uh, religious uh, service. I got graduate degrees, studied at uh, both Jewish graduate schools and Christian graduate schools, uh, got a doctorate in, um, uh, in theology. Uh, my uh, area of uh, focus in uh, all of my studies was the biblical languages, Greek and Hebrew, especially Hebrew. Uh, that is my passion. In fact, on my uh, YouTube channel, I have a uh, uh, video series uh, that is called Hebrew School, uh, where you can learn to uh, read, write, and speak both biblical and modern uh, Hebrew. So if you're interested in that, uh, as I was in my studies, uh, then you can learn some Hebrew, and I think you'll find that it's uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of fun. Uh, during my retirement, I have written uh, a number of books, uh, four uh, at this point, uh, to be exact. Uh, my first book, and I think the most important one, is called Yeshua, He Will Be Called a Nazarene. And uh, that is a, a kind of a history book of the Second Temple era. Uh, it has a, a lot to do with the... Um, uh, the um, uh, coming into existence of the what I would call the three denominations of uh, Judaism, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Essenes. And then there was a, a branch group of the Essenes uh, called the Nazarenes. The Essenes, of course, have uh, in recent times uh, become uh, most well known for their association with the Qumran community, which produced uh, and then hid uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, which remained hidden for about 2,000 years and only were uh, discovered uh, back in the late 1940s and, uh, uh, you know, about the 30 years uh, following, they've been discovered and ju have just given us a treasure trove of uh, information uh, about the biblical uh, period. So I wrote about that. Um, I uh, asserted in my book that uh, Jesus was not only associated with the Essenes and Nazarenes, but uh, he was called a Nazarene because he was a part of that uh, denomination or uh, that sect, the religious sect of the Nazarenes. And um, uh, so uh, that uh, is kind of uh, really important stuff and uh, is really a, a great benefit in interpreting, uh, especially the, the New Testament books, especially the uh, Gospels. And I have written commentaries on 
um, uh, the Gospels, the Book of Acts, uh, and the Book of Romans uh, so far. And at the time of this recording, I'm working on a commentary on First and Second uh, Corinthians. So that's enough about me. Let's talk about the Bible. Since we're going to be studying the Bible on one foot, uh, let's get a little background uh, to, uh, to the Bible. And uh, although, um, you know, most of us have our Bible under one cover, uh, we need to appreciate that uh, that one volume Bible that we are able to carry around with us is actually the world's greatest library. The uh, Old Testament uh, contains 39 books and the New Testament 27 uh, books. Uh, the uh, books of the Old Testament are written by um, quite a few different authors. Uh, the books were written at different times, in different places, different circumstances by people who lived in different lands, uh, were of different backgrounds. Um, uh, but the, the one kind of interesting thing is that with all of that diversity and with the uh, period of time that's covered uh, by the Old Testament, which is um, uh, about uh, 4,000 years in uh, history, uh, we have a variety of different books that are in, uh, I, would, I would say, perfect uh, harmony. Uh, the only um, a break in that harmony is where uh, human frailty has uh, entered into the, uh, to the picture, the uh, transmission of the original uh, inspired uh, uh, manuscripts that were written by the chosen biblical authors have come to, uh, uh, down to us in copies. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Of course, the, um, uh, the Torah that we've already talked a little bit about is the first five books of the Bible. That's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Uh, the first volume is kind of the background that goes all the way back to creation up until the time of the, the beginning of Moses' writings of these five books. Uh, so uh, Genesis covers a lot of history. But then we get into the law, the law of Moses. Uh, which is writings about uh, how we should live. And of course, that's in the historical context of the uh, Israelites uh, living in uh, Egypt in slavery, uh, being liberated by God under the leadership of Moses. Uh, then we come to the aftermath of the Exodus. We have the book of Joshua, who was uh, Moses' assistant. Uh, after Joshua passed from the scene, there uh, were a number of judges uh, in Israel that led the people. Uh, during that time, the book of Ruth was uh, written. Uh, Samuel is said to be the last of the judges and the first of the significant prophets uh, in, in the Bible. He was in a leadership uh, position that um, uh, kind of um, went between the, the period of the judges as leaders and the period of kings as leaders. Uh, first and second uh, Samuel are the story of uh, Samuel, then King Saul, then King David, and then uh, first and second kings are the um, uh, mainly the history of the kings that followed. There are two parallel volumes called first and second chronicles that were really probably written much after of that time, but they were kind of the official records of the kings of Israel, particularly the southern kings, and we'll talk more about the division of the land into uh, northern and southern uh, kingdoms of Israel and uh, Judah. Um, uh, one of the uh, uh, historical events that's chronicled here is the uh, Babylonian captivity, where the Israelites had to leave the promised land because of their sinfulness and, and go to exile in Babylon for about 70 years. Um, then Ezra, Nehemiah, uh, Esther uh, talk about the um, uh, like the uh, coming back uh, into the the promised land, rebuilding the temple, rebuilding their cities, and rebuilding their lives, uh, basically. So those are the historical books. Uh, during the period of the uh, kings, especially, um, God began to uh, use in a very powerful and significant way. Uh, men that he had called into the office of uh, prophets, although 
uh, the uh, the prophets were not limited to men. There were some uh, uh, very uh, effective and uh, faithful female uh, pastors, uh, uh, prophets as well. Uh, we have the major prophets, and and really, I think they're called the major prophets because the books they wrote are, were so big. Isaiah is a large uh, volume. Jeremiah is a large volume. Then we have Lamentations, which is a small book, but it was written by Jeremiah. And uh, he wrote concerning his uh, concern and his um, uh, his uh, kind of depression and mourning and grieving over the destruction of Jerusalem, which uh, led to the Babylonian captivity. Ezekiel was a prophet who wrote during the captivity. And then Daniel was one who was exiled to, um, uh, to Babylon and later uh, to Persia uh, during that captivity. And he wrote uh, what are called apocalyptic um, uh, records, prophecies, predictions about the future, uh, predictions that are so accurate uh, that a lot of uh, skeptical theologians have said Daniel must have been written uh, hundreds of years after uh, Daniel uh, lived because his uh, prophecies are so accurate that nobody could be that accurate. They, they must have been written after the uh, things he predicted were uh, fulfilled. Well, the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, destroyed that theory because uh, there were copies of, um, uh, of Daniel uh, in existence among the Dead Sea Scrolls much, uh, much earlier than was uh, supposed by these the theological skeptics. Uh, then we have the holy writings uh, or the poetic books that would be Job and Psalms and Proverbs. Psalms was kind of the uh, hymnal of the Old Testament era. And then we have uh, kind of wisdom books, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and then kind of a love story, the uh, Song of uh, Solomon. Um, uh, even the Bible itself refers to a uh, period of silence between uh, when the last book of the Old Testament was written and the first book of the New Testament uh, was written. But I tell you what, historically speaking, that um, intertestamental period was anything but silent. There were some uh, hugely significant uh, events that took place and kind of uh, set the stage for uh, the uh, savior of the world, the promised Messiah. Uh, he was Jesus Christ or Yeshua, uh, the Mashiach, the Messiah, uh, who came on the scene uh, during the Roman era. There were four books that were written about his life, either by eyewitnesses and disciples of his or by close associates um, uh, of that uh, group of disciples. Uh, after Jesus uh, died on the cross for the sins of the world and then rose again in the resurrection and ascended into heaven, uh, the uh, followers of Yeshua continued to do his work. Um, fulfilling the Great Commission and taking the good news of the gospel to all the world, making disciples through baptism and teaching, uh, and uh, really kind of turning the, the Roman world uh, upside down in, uh, in uh, just a, a very short period of time. So the Acts are kind of the missionary works of the followers of Jesus. Uh, then we have the uh, epistles or the letters that were written to certain churches or individuals, Many of them were written by the Apostle Paul, who uh, started out his career as an enemy of the church, persecuting it, even putting one uh, follower, uh, Stephen, uh, to death, uh, kind of as a heretic. Uh, but Paul encountered the risen Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus and became a convert himself, and uh, probably one of the most devoted of uh, Jesus, uh, Yeshua's uh, uh, apostolic uh, followers. He was a great and uh, effective uh, missionary. And then the New Testament also has a book of uh, prophecy. Many of the uh, predictions in that book uh, have yet to be fulfilled in history, but uh, because all the prior uh, prophecies have been fulfilled, it's very uh, likely, I would say certain, that the prophecies of Revelation uh, will be fulfilled. And as we look at the um, um, uh, the environment around us, the, um, uh, as we look at the evening news on television, we see the stage being set uh, for the uh, dramatic return of Jesus Christ, Yeshua the Messiah, 
in power and great glory to uh, become the uh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords and so forth. So uh, wh what about this uh, book, uh, the Bible? Uh, what does the Bible uh, have to say, uh, to say about itself? Well, for one thing, the Bible uh, says about itself that it is different from all other books uh, for a few di different reasons. One of those is recorded in uh, one of the, our New Testament books, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, where uh, the Apostle Paul writes, all scripture, uh, scriptures, it's another word for the Bible, is given by inspiration of God. Now, this, in, uh, this word inspiration, uh, of course, the Apostle Paul uh, wrote his books uh, originally in Greek. Although there is a, uh, a, a pretty um, uh, solid uh, theory that uh, originally the New Testament books were written in the Hebrew language and then translated into Greek uh, for a universal worldwide uh, audience. Uh, not all the people of the um, civilized world at that time uh, spoke Hebrew, but virtually everybody spoke Greek at that time. So. The New Testament documents have come down to us in Greek, and the Greek word that Paul uses for inspiration is the Greek word theopneustos, uh, which means God breathed. So God actually breathed. He uh, communicated uh, the things that he wanted written in the Bible uh, to those he chose to uh, write it. So uh, we say that the Bible is an inspired book. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. It's uh, it has a like a variety of uh, very practical uh, uses. One of the conclusions that we come to is if the uh, Bible is inspired by God, and uh, those who were chosen to uh, write it were accurate in uh, recording the words that. Uh, God told them to write, then we should be able to be confident that everything in the Bible is true, it is accurate, it is completely reliable. Uh, we should not be able to find any mistakes uh, in the Bible, and uh, uh, that is uh, uh, that is what the um, uh, kind of the universal church has uh, believed uh, throughout the centuries. Uh, in recent times, uh, some of these skeptical theologians that I was talking about before have uh, questioned the uh, accuracy of the Bible. They have proposed um, alleged contradictions uh, in the Bible. Actually, uh, the, the charge of contradictions in the Bible is nothing new. Uh, those uh, supposed contradictions have been around for uh, hundreds, even thousands of uh, years. And uh, there has been uh, plenty of opportunity for those to be refuted uh, by people who uh, know a little bit about the Bible, uh, especially those who are familiar with the biblical languages of Greek and Hebrew. And uh, there have been uh, numerous books that have, have been written answering the uh, challenges of alleged contradictions in the Bible. And most of those uh, supposed contradictions um, are, are not that difficult to, to solve. So uh, the Bible is a, com a completely trustworthy um, uh, book, not only uh, inspired, but, uh, but completely, uh, uh, completely reliable. The theological word for that reliability is inerrancy. There are no errors uh, in it. Another Bible verse is 2 Peter 1.21. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So um, uh, the books of the Bible are not the creation and the um, uh, result of the vivid imagination of the men uh, who wrote it. Uh, God basically sat them down at their writing desks and dictated uh, the things that, that he wanted uh, written. Uh, in his book, the Bible is God's book. He is the uh, original uh, author of, of the Bible. Uh, there are some more things that the, uh, the Bible records uh, saying about itself. Uh, Yeshua himself, Jesus Christ himself, in the Sermon on the Mount, um, uh, undoubtedly uh, had been accused of kind of ignoring and disregarding and maybe even disrespecting uh, the Old Testament, uh, 
Um, his uh, teachings were so uh, different and radical that, than the people were uh, talking about that uh, he was probably charged with with disrespecting or um, uh, kind of ignoring and uh, uh, I guess those are the, the best words to use in describing that, uh, his relationship with the Old Testament. But he said, um, uh, I, I did not come to destroy or disrespect or abolish the uh, Old Testament, the law of Moses. Uh, but he said, I came to fulfill it. So um, uh, a lot of that fulfillment would be in personally fulfilling predict, uh, predictive prophecies about the Messiah, about himself. Uh, these would be predictions that would be uh, totally beyond his ability to kind of manipulate circumstances and fulfill by his own kind of willpower and choices and stuff like that. Uh, a number of Old Testament prophecies had predicted the place and the time that he would be born. And, uh, you know, how could, how could he affect the uh, outcome of that, of, of, of where and when he would uh, be born? But, but his birth uh, fulfilled uh, to the letter the, the predictions that were made about it. So uh, Yeshua went on to say, truly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or one tittle will by uh, any means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Now, jot is an English word that translates the Hebrew word yod, Y-O-D. Yod is the smallest letter of the Hebrew language. Um, it looks like a, a, um, uh, an apostrophe uh, in uh, English. It's, uh, it's that small. And then he also talks about the tittle, uh, which is a portion of some Hebrew letters that distinguish them from uh, other ones. For example, the uh, thing that uh, distinguishes a uh, chet letter in uh, Hebrew from a uh, tav letter in Hebrew is just one little portion, uh, just one little wing, one little um, uh, uh, stroke of the pen, uh, that distinguishes one letter from another. And of course, if you can't tell the difference between those two letters, uh, it's um, uh, the effect of that is, is huge. It's very impactful. So Jesus is saying that accuracy in the Bible comes down to not only the general ideas in the Bible, uh, inspiration is not limited to that, uh, it's also not limited uh, to the, um, say, the sentences or paragraphs in the Bible. It's not limited even to the words that are used, the particular singular words that are used in the Bible. But accuracy and inspiration in the Bible goes all the way to letters and parts of letters. So uh, with that in mind, uh, my goodness, uh, the uh, reliability of the Bible is, um, is uh, just, uh, it's extraordinary. Uh, Jesus would also say later in John's gospel, the scripture cannot be broken. Uh, in other words, it, ca it can't be found false. Uh, it, uh, you, you can't prove these uh, alleged uh, contradictions and, uh, and historical difficulties. Uh, that are accused in the Bible. Then uh, uh, towards the end of his ministry, uh, Jesus uh, gathered together with his disciples and, uh, you know, explained to them that he was going to be leaving uh, the scene soon. He was going to die on the cross, rise from the dead, and ascend to the Father's house with many mansions from whence he had come. And uh, they were kind of feeling like he was going to abandon them and leave them as orphans. Uh, but he, he indicated that God's plan involved uh, not only himself, the second person of the so-called Trinity, but also the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. So uh, after he had explained to them that he would be leaving, he said, when he, he with the capital H, that is the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth has come. He will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you of things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it uh, to you. 
uh, uh, he was speaking those words to uh, many of the men who would be chosen to write the New Testament. And basically, he was telling them that when they sat down to write their books of the Bible, the Holy Spirit would give them all true information to write down. Um, you know, the, the, the only uh, flaw in that system would be uh, if they misheard him or misrecorded the words that he spoke or something like that. So uh, when we pick up our Bibles, we have a uh, completely reliable and uh, accurate uh, love letter from God. Every word, every letter is inspired uh, by him, uh, making it totally trustworthy. And uh, with that being the fact, we can conform our lives to it. If we believe the uh, truths that are written in the Bible, then we will be like Abraham, and our faith will be credited to us as righteousness. Uh, Jesus explained that when that happens, when our faith is credited to us as righteousness, that we are born again. We get a brand new start. The Holy Spirit enters into our bodies. He claims our bodies to be his temple. He is our constant companion. He enlightens us to God's truth. It's actually possible to read the Bible without the Holy Spirit and not understand much of it. Uh, but when we have the Holy Spirit to enlighten us and teach us about the things that the Bible says, uh, then we will um, uh, understand and believe the things that we're supposed to understand and believe. And uh, we're going to get a, a, a brand new life. Uh, I have never grown tired of the new life that God uh, gave me back in, in 1980. I've continued to grow in my faith and my knowledge and understanding. I've come to the realization that I'll never exhaust uh, the amount of uh, truth and knowledge that is available to me in the Bible, and all of it is for my benefit, uh, and all of it is for the uh, benefit of the um, people that God has placed in my path to, uh, to kind of help them. Uh, a couple of things that we want to uh, talk about uh, with regard to the Bible is different paradigms of biblical interpretation. Uh, the Apostle Paul writes in 2 Timothy 2.15 uh, to uh, Timothy, a young pastor that he had trained and, of course, loved, and he had mentored uh, Timothy. He said, be diligent, Timothy, to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. Um, one of the important um, skills uh, that a person, especially a Bible teacher, um, uh, must learn is, um, is how to interpret the Bible consistently and uh, in harmony with the entire um, uh, revelation of God in the scriptures. Uh, so you're really not allowed to sit down with one Bible verse and make it mean uh, what you think it means or what you want it to mean. Uh, you need to uh, interpret the Bible in light of the entire context of the Bible and in, in the context of all 66 uh, books of, of God's uh, revelation. So that's kind of a big responsibility. And uh, uh, part of that process of correctly interpreting the Bible means rightly dividing it. Most of us are familiar with the fact that our Bibles uh, are divided into uh, two sections, kind of volume one and volume two. The first section is the Old Testament, and the second section is the New Testament. That's a significant division. Uh, but according to the uh, approach that we'll be taking to interpreting the Bible, uh, it will be divided in a lot more places uh, as well. Uh, which brings us to the uh, kind of the debate, uh, the options that are available to us in interpreting the Bible. Uh, so we come to the um, uh, dichotomy of covenant theology versus dispensational theology. Let me talk first of all about covenant uh, theology. Covenant theology is largely Calvinistic. Covenant theologians are mainly followers of John Calvin. Uh, who lived, uh, I, you know, I think in the 15, 1600s, uh, hundreds, um, uh, was a very influential uh, theologian, lived about the same time as uh, Martin Luther, 
Uh, so um, uh, John Calvin's uh, approach to interpreting the Bible, first of all, kind of rested on the foundational principle that there was no such thing as free will. Uh, the will was um, uh, completely submissive uh, to God's um, uh, election and predestination of events. Uh, basically, uh, anything that um, God's creatures think is uh, free will is actually just a playing out of uh, God's ordination. Uh, he's got the whole thing scoped out. He knows exactly uh, what you're going to believe, what you're going to do, how you're going to live your life, whether or not you'll be saved, and so forth. Um, Calvinism is uh, usually presented under the acronym uh, TULIP, let me see if I can remember what the letters of TULIP stand for. The T stands for total depravity. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're conceived and born sinful, as the Bible says. So uh, there's nothing in us that's deserving of uh, salvation, uh, basically. That's the T. The U uh, stands for unconditional election. And what this means is uh, that because we don't have any free will, uh, you know, there's no choice that we can make or there's no behavior that we can exhibit uh, that is going to earn us the choice on uh, God's part about whether, uh, or whether we're going to be uh, saved. So Calvinists basically say that there is some unrevealed um, um, reason that God chooses some people for salvation and others for, uh, for damnation. Uh, the L in TULIP stands for limited atonement, which means that when Jesus went to the cross, he was only paying for the sins of the elect, not for the sins of the whole world, but only for the elect. So uh, Jesus did not die for everybody's sins, but he died only for those who were, uh, were chosen to, uh, to, uh, to receive salvation uh, uh, from God. Let's see, T-U-L-I, uh, I believe uh, stands for irresistible grace. In other words, uh, when the gospel is preached or shared with a person who is elected, uh, they can't resist it. Um, no matter how much they don't want to be a Christian, uh, they're not able to do that because God has uh, chosen them. So uh, grace is irresistible. Uh, when the gospel is presented to those who are chosen for damnation, um, there's nothing they can do to receive it and to, uh, to benefit by it. And then the uh, P in TULIP, I believe, stands for persistence uh, of the, the saints. In other words, it's the idea that once saved, always saved. Uh, all true believers will uh, persist in their faith uh, to the end. When they die physically, they'll go to heaven and spend uh, eternity with God. So that's uh, TULIP. Uh, I believe the Bible uh, disproves uh, some of those, particularly the limited atonement. I believe it's 1 John 2.2 2, or perhaps 2 John 2.2 2, uh, that says that Jesus died uh, for our sins, but not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. So that would be every uh, human being who's ever lived past, present, and future. And I think that uh, <clears throat> it kind of disproves uh, covenant theology, it can be uh, disproven on uh, several other levels as well. There are three major covenants of uh, covenant theology. I believe they are the covenant of law, the covenant of works, and the covenant of redemption. And those are indeed biblical uh, covenants, uh, uh, legitimate. Um, the, uh, one of the um, uh, most uh, probably prophetically significant characteristics of covenant theology is that the vast majority of uh, covenant theologians and those who follow them believe that God is done with Israel. Uh, when Israel and the Jewish people uh, rejected their Messiah in the first advent of Jesus Christ, uh, God turned to the church, to the largely Gentile church, and that there is no future for Israel. This is called replacement theology, and uh, replacement theologians believe that all the promises, especially in the Old Testament, that were made to Israel, 
uh, have now transferred over to the uh, Christian church. So basically, God is done with Israel. Uh, covenant theologians uh, see very little significance in the uh, return of the Jewish people uh, during the Zionist movement of the, uh, what would it be, the late 19th uh, century into the 20th century and uh, continuing today. Uh, they, they see no significance uh, in that, at least no prophetic uh, significance. Uh, that's covenant theology. The, um, uh, the uh, alternative is uh, dispensational uh, theology. And uh, probably the greatest uh, characteristic of dispensational theology is that it divides uh, biblical history into different segments, uh, different eras, different ages. Uh, dispensationalism talks about the age of innocence, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Uh, talks about the age of conscience, human government, the age of promise, the age of law, when uh, the law of Moses was written during the uh, Exodus, uh, the age of grace, uh, which is the age we're living in now. The first part of the age of grace was the uh, life and ministry of Yeshua. Uh, after that, the age of the church. And then the last portion of the age of grace will be the seven-year great uh, tribulation. That will be followed by the millennial kingdom, the thousand-year kingdom, which in turn is followed by the eternal perfect state, or the new heavens and the new earth and the new uh, Jerusalem. Again, a kind of a, a, a unique uh, distinction of uh, dispensational theology is that it does believe uh, that uh, God has a future for Israel. Uh, they uh, see great significance in the Zionist movement of the uh, late 19th and 20th uh, century. Uh, they see great significance to the uh, 1947 uh, United Nations uh, declaration that uh, the land of Palestine, as it was known then, uh, was um, uh, kind of officially uh, a homeland uh, for the Jewish uh, people. Uh, in May of the next year, 1948, the, um, uh, the uh, leaders of the uh, Jewish people in Israel declared an independent uh, new uh, state, actually kind of a renewed, a renewed state from biblical times. Uh, Jews had been out of the land for basically 2,000 years. Now they were back, and Israel was back on the map uh, again. Uh, dispensationalists also believe that um, uh, the Zionist movement uh, and uh, uh, some of the uh, things that are going on uh, current, uh, currently and current events are setting the stage for uh, the, not only the Great Tribulation, seven years, but then the return of Christ and the Millennial Kingdom. Dispensationalists believe that there will be a literal thousand-year uh, uh, kingdom uh, with Jesus uh, ruling on King David's throne from Jerusalem. Uh, physically and materially and actually in history, uh, believe that that will happen. Uh, covenant theologians uh, usually take the approach of amillennialism. Uh, in other words, that there is no millennium, that all the predictions of the millennium are, are basically just symbolic or figurative of the, uh, the church age, the uh, age of grace in which we now live. So they are not expecting a future uh, millennial uh, kingdom. Dispensationalists are expecting a kingdom. In fact, one of the uh, uh, major um, uh, characteristics of dispensationalism is that almost all dispensationalists believe in what they call a pre-tribulation rapture that um, uh, in order to uh, avoid uh, God's uh, precious chosen uh, people, uh, believers in him, uh, in order to uh, help them avoid going through the great tribulation period, uh, God will just snatch them up to uh, heaven. In the harpazo is the, the Greek word that the Apostle Paul uses in uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 and following. Uh, so, uh, 
that is uh, the rapture is uh, also a, probably a, a better theological term for it would be the resurrection of the righteous. And dispensationalists believe that the unbelievers will not be raised in a resurrection until a thousand years uh, uh, after that. Uh, one other thing I want to talk about is uh, different levels of biblical interpretation. And I like to use this four-step paradigm that has been in Judaism uh, for a long, long time. Uh, it is called the Pardes um, paradigm. Uh, uh, the Hebrew letters for uh, Pardes are here. Uh, Pardes is where um, uh, we get the term paradise because pardes is a Hebrew word for an orchard or a garden, like the Garden of Eden, which is also referred to, especially in, in Greek translations of the Bible, as, uh, par as paradise. Uh, this, too, is an acronym. The P in pardes uh, stands for the Hebrew word pashat, which means the simple, literal meaning of the words in Bible verses. And this is, um, uh, if you can master the Peshat, Peshat actually means to strip bare. So it's, um, it's, it's what the Bible says in just very basic, straightforward sentences. That stuff is truth. Uh, when you start adding interpretations and opinions uh, and insights, uh, all of which uh, originate in human beings, that's when you come up with different interpretations. Uh, that's when uh, mistakes are made. So at this very basic Peshat level, uh, that's what I like to focus on uh, the most. That's where you get the most truth. Then the next step in the process is the R in Pardes. It's the Hebrew word remez which means a hint or a suggestion. So that's where you start looking at context. You start looking at other Bible passages that say basically the same thing, parallel passages, um, uh, other teachings in different places in the Bible on the same subject and so forth. So um, uh, also there are a lot of words that are used in the Bible that can have two different uh, meanings, and uh, whichever one is the appropriate meaning is very significant. Uh, we will take a look at uh, one of those words in uh, the very first um, first two verses of, of the Bible, uh, which will help, help us to uh, determine how old the earth is. Uh, so um, uh, the, uh, the remes can be a very valuable, but, uh, uh, you know, I must warn you that at this level, uh, we have uh, human intelligence and human insight enters into the picture, so there's always room for error. Uh, the D in Parda stands for drash or midrash. Uh, a lot of English speakers are familiar with the word midrash. Midrash is kind of a deep dive into the text. It's just you like you dredge out every ounce of meaning that you can find uh, in the text itself. So it's deep dive. Uh, this is where we uh, come up with systematic theology, uh, uh, what kind of paradigms or patterns, systems of uh, theological insights and so forth. Uh, this is how, kind of how we uh, build a foundation of uh, uh, what we can expect from God, how God works, how we work, how the world works, and, and so forth. That's at the drash or midrash level. And then the last level is the sod. Uh, sod is a Hebrew word that means mystery or secrets. Uh, this is stuff like the Bible codes and the Masara, the uh, numerology. Um, it it uh, sometimes ventures into things like mysticism, Kabbalah in uh, Judaism. And uh, of course, there's Christian mysticism uh, too. Uh, like I say, these are the Bible codes. These are things that God has uh, kind of hidden in the text, equidistant letter sequences. Like, for example, I found out when I was in seminary that if you start with the first yod uh, in the uh, Old Testament and count uh, 50 letters later, you come to a hey, uh, count 50 more letters, you come to a vav, and uh, 50 more letters, and you come to a hey. And that is the yod hey vav hey. That is the sacred name of God, usually pronounced Yahweh. Uh, and if you just keep counting 50 uh, letter distance sequences, it just says 
the Lord's name over and over and over again. I got tired of counting 50 letter sequences, but it kept spelling that out. So they're kind of uh, hidden uh, things in the Bible. Um, I usually won't want to go that, uh, that deep because there is huge um, opportunity for error at uh, that point. So, so those are some of the things that we will consider as we uh, study the Bible, as I have probably um, alluded to in this uh, discussion, I will be following a dispensational approach uh, to the, the Bible, which I think is the best one. I want to spend a little bit of time here looking at the history of both the Old Testament and the New Testament. On the screen before you, uh, we have the, old, uh, the period of Old Testament history. Uh, this is out of a, a book of Bible charts uh, by um, uh, Tim LaHaye, who wrote the Left Behind series. Uh, he and Thomas Ice um, put together uh, a book of biblical charts. They're really neat charts. Uh, there are a lot of charts available. I'll be talking about some of the charts that I'll be using in, in this course. And um, uh, we just have the uh, kind of the chronology of the Old Testament uh, before us here. It starts with ages past, before the creation. And then in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Adam and Eve were the first human beings he put here. Uh, then uh, what would this be about 1600 years later in 2385 BC? Uh, is the flood of uh, Noah, and you have all these people living all these uh, almost thousand-year uh, lifespans in this period of time. We'll talk about how that might uh, have been uh, possible. It's called the antediluvian diluvian period, or the time before the uh, before the uh, before the flood. Uh, so uh, actually, if the flood is here at 2385, then the um, creation of the world and Adam and Eve uh, is, um, uh, no, uh, let me rephrase that. Uh, it's not the uh, time of the creation or what I would call the original creation, but it is the time of the creation of Adam and Eve. I'll just leave a little bit of a mystery there, a little bit of a sowed there. Uh, and, until we get to our, uh, our next uh, lesson. So between Adam and the flood, uh, there is about 1600 years, which makes the, what, the birthday, the creation day of Adam, uh, about 4000 BC. I think Bishop Usher uh, in the Middle Ages made it 4004 uh, BC. Then we have the call of Abraham, um, in uh, about the year 2000 uh, BC, 1958 BC, this makes it. Uh, it's very interesting here that the uh, time span between the call of Abraham and the Exodus is 430 years. And uh, Tim LaHaye didn't just make up that figure. That's how, uh, uh, how long the Apostle Paul says it lasted in uh, Galatians uh, chapter 3. Uh, but this proves to us that there is no way that the Israelites spent 400 years in slavery in Egypt, uh, because the whole period of time between Abraham and the Exodus is 430 years, and Joseph was the one who entered Egypt. So we only have, uh, this is going to turn out to be about 250 uh, years that they were actually in slavery in Egypt. The rest of the 400 years that the Bible talks about was spent in Canaan, uh, where they owned no land. They had not received the, the promised land yet and uh, lived under the, oh, what, what should we call it, uh, lived with uh, Gentiles, uh, some of whom were uh, hostile to them. Then we've got the uh, 40 years in the wilderness, the entering of Canaan under the leadership of Joshua, and uh, we go uh, through to the uh, kingdom established uh, with uh, Samuel anointing first Saul, then David, then Solomon. Uh, there's the period of the divided uh, kingdom, the fall of the uh, northern uh, kingdom of that divided kingdom was in 722 BC, and then the Babylonian captivity started in 605 BC. I think that's when Daniel and his three friends went to uh, Babylon. The uh, city of Jerusalem and uh, the uh, temple 
there were, um, uh, it's generally thought to be uh, in 586 uh, BC, they were destroyed. Uh, we have the decree of uh, Cyrus, uh, which uh, kind of brings to an end the uh, captivity, allows the Jewish people to return uh, to their uh, homeland in Israel to uh, rebuild their homes, rebuild their, uh, especially their capital city and uh, their uh, temple uh, building. And that brings us to the kind of the silent years, the intertestamental uh, period of time uh, when the, uh, all of the denominations were born, the, the sects of Judaism, Sadducees, Pharisees, and Essenes and Nazarenes were built. And then this period ends with the um, uh, the coming of Christ, the first advent of Christ. The reason we're looking at this chart is to show when the uh, various books of the Old Testament were written. And I think this one is interesting because it shows that Job was the first uh, book of the Bible written, even before Genesis. Uh, so uh, Genesis and the other uh, five books of the Bible were written about 1500 BC by Moses. Uh, but Job lived before that, and somebody wrote a book about, he may have written a book, uh, uh, the book about himself. It may be an autobiography, or somebody else uh, may have written it. But it um, uh, is thought by many theologians to have been written uh, back in the days of Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob. So Job may be the first book of the Bible that was ever written. If it was, it's interesting because it addresses the, the subject of the suffering of uh, God's chosen people, God's uh, favorites, uh, the, the uh, suffering of the righteous, and give some answers about that. Tells us something about our enemy, uh, the devil, uh, as well. So we'll be talking about where he came from and when he uh, came from. That will be uh, interesting stuff. Uh, Satan plays an important role in the book of Job. Then we have the books of Moses, followed by the historical books, etc. Uh, we have the historical books in here, the books about the kings. Uh, we have the prophetic books uh, that are written. And uh, all of those uh, books of the Old Testament were written on scrolls. They were written on scrolls because bound books that, you know, you bind on one side so you can open them and, and page through the pages uh, are called codexes, and uh, codexes had not been invented yet. They were invented about the time of the, uh, the silent years, the intertestamental period. Uh, uh, they were just starting to learn how to do um, uh, codexes or, or bound uh, books, but uh, uh, most all of the Old Testament books were written on scrolls. It is significant to point out that uh, all of the Old Testament books are written in the Hebrew language uh, with a few sections of some of those books written in the Aramaic uh, language. Uh, parts of Ezra, parts of Daniel, maybe some others uh, have some uh, Aramaic uh, sections. Aramaic and Hebrew are sister languages. Aramaic is the language of Babylon and uh, Syria. Um, uh, so if, if you can read Hebrew, you can pretty much make out uh, Aramaic. They're very uh, similar uh, languages. And some Aramaic as a result of the uh, Babylonian exile, Babylonian captivity, uh, some of that uh, Aramaic entered into the, um, the Old Testament books. The theory that uh, Jesus uh, and his uh, apostles at that time, everybody at that time, spoke Aramaic, I think is demonstrably false. The uh, Dead Sea Scrolls have basically uh, proven uh, that. And uh, as I mentioned before, there is even a theory that uh, the New Testament books, uh, many of the New Testament books were originally written in uh, Hebrew and then later translated uh, to uh, uh, to a Greek. Uh, there is a, uh, uh, a group of theologians from Hebrew University that believe that's the case, and they've uh, put out some pretty persuasive evidence uh, about it. So uh, there's the Old Testament and the history that it came out of. Our next slide is kind of the same. Uh, it's the, it's the right-hand side of the same uh, chart, and it covers the New Testament uh, period. 
um, uh, starts. Uh, the the uh, books of the New Testament are written here in two columns. It starts on the left-hand column with James, which is probably the first book of the New Testament that was written in 50 AD, uh, then 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st uh, Corinthians, uh, Romans, etc., all the way down the line till we come to the last books of the Bible, Revelation probably being the last Bible uh, book written in uh, at around the end of the first uh, century, AD 96, or uh, somewhere in that vicinity. So uh, those books of the Bible were all written in the early church era. Uh, then the kind of historical timeline uh, brings us to uh, 313 uh, AD, when Christianity becomes a state church that was under the influence of Emperor Constantine. Um, uh, earlier, uh, before Constantine, the uh, Christian church was persecuted uh, very vigorously for a couple of uh, centuries. Uh, it's interesting that the followers of Yeshua were, uh, in the first century, were persecuted, first of all, uh, by the other sects of Judaism, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And then uh, the Romans kind of turned on uh, all of the Jews, uh, including the uh, Nazarenes, and uh, persecuted them as well. Well, the persecution basically came to an end uh, in the reign of Constantine, and uh, Constantine became a Christian, so everybody in the empire became a Christian. <clears throat> And that probably sounded pretty good on the surface, but uh, one of the things that they discovered was that uh, there were an awful lot of people sitting in pews in Christian churches uh, who did not really believe the Bible and had not been born again, and uh, an awful lot of evil entered into the church. And so that's why we have this lo long period of uh, the state church during the Dark uh, Ages. Uh, we come to the um, uh, basically the time of the Protestant Reformation, which started in 1517. That's when Martin Luther nailed the, um, what was it, the 95 Theses on the, the door of the uh, chapel at, uh, at Wittenberg, uh, where he lived. And uh, he basically just wanted to get a debate going, but he was charged with heresy and threatened with burning at the stake. So, um, a lot of people, uh, you know, believed in his cause and followed behind him. People in all different uh, regions uh, in uh, Europe um, uh, became part of the uh, Protestant Reformation. One of the reasons that that happened was the invention of the printing press uh, at about that same time. The first Bible was printed uh, rather than copied uh, by hand, letter by letter and word by word in manuscript form. The first uh, printed Bible was in the year 1455. So uh, Luther and the other reformers came at a, uh, at a good time. Uh, we have uh, here a uh, little illustration of the Wycliffe version. It was one of the first uh, English, maybe the first uh, English translation of the Bible. I believe Wycliffe translated uh, from the Latin uh, Bible, uh, uh, probably the one that Jerome uh, translated, the old Latin uh, version, um, and uh, uh, translated that into English. Uh, he was declared a heretic for doing that because you weren't supposed to translate the Bible out of Latin. Uh, then we have the Tyndale version, the Coverdale version, the Great Virgin Geneva, Bishop's Bible, and finally the King James Version in 1611. These are all English versions of the Bible, and uh, King Henry VIII uh, uh, played kind of a prominent role uh, in, uh, in this, and I won't go down the trail of King Henry VIII. Uh, there was a lot of pretty terrible stuff that uh, happened there, but this was uh, kind of the dividing line. It, it gave rise to uh, all the Protestant uh, churches, but I guess uh, the, the Protestants learned that since it was okay to protest, uh, they protested not only against the Roman Catholic Church, but also against each other. So that's why there are so many different uh, denominations. And uh, it may be kind of naive, but I, I pray that our little Bible study here, the Bible on one foot, will uh, you know provide uh, kind of a theological foundation for bringing all these divided 
uh, Protestant Christian churches uh, together. One of the things that I want to talk about here is uh, these uh, different manuscripts that are indicated here. And again, uh, these are called Codex uh, Sinaiticus, Codex Alexandrinus, Codex Vaticanus, and Codex Ephraim. Uh, th these are bound books, as you can see in the, uh, in the uh, uh, pictures. Um, these are some of the oldest Greek manuscripts of the Bible. They're dated, a couple of them, in the 300s AD or CE common era, if you prefer, and then a couple of them in the mid, uh, what would that be, the fifth uh, century, so fourth and fifth century uh, manuscripts. Uh, this one Ephraim is uh, included in uh, Tim LaHaye's uh, chart here. It is not nearly held in as great esteem as these other three. Uh, and uh, basically, all the modern translations of the Bible are based on this little group of uh, manuscripts. And I'm talking about like the New International Version, the English Standard Version. Basically, all the modern uh, translations of the, of the Bible are based on these, this small group of manuscripts. I have also uh, added a uh, text, a Greek text here that uh, Tim LaHaye did not put on his chart. It's the majority text, uh, one of its uh, most famous um, additions was the received text or the Textus Receptus upon which the uh, King James Version and probably all of these English versions uh, that were translated from uh, Greek uh, were based on. So King James Version and the modern New King James Version are based on the majority text. There are literally thousands of manuscripts in the majority text, copies of, uh, of the Bible uh, that make up the majority text, literally thousands of them that are near copy machine uh, accuracy. And the uh, symbol in the theological works for the majority text is a, uh, a what is that, an Old English capital M. Uh, these other manuscripts are uh, recognized by a Hebrew Aleph, then a capital A, capital B, and capital uh, C. One of the things you need to know about these, uh, the Sinaitic and the Alexandrinus uh, uh, manuscripts are from Egypt, from, from North Egypt, Sinaiticus from what is thought to be uh, Mount Sinai in the Sinai Peninsula. It's actually not the biblical Mount Sinai, but that's where this manuscript was found. And then, of course, Alexandria in Egypt is a, a prominent city where there was a huge um, uh, Jewish uh, scholarly uh, community that um, um, uh, translated the um, uh, the Old Testament from Hebrew into Greek. I don't know if we mentioned that before. Here's the Septuagint being translated in uh, 280 BC from uh, Hebrew into uh, into the Greek uh, language. Septuagint just is the Greek word for 70. That's why the Roman numeral LXX is used. And the story goes that 70 Jewish scholars uh, were the committee that made that uh, translation. Um, the Vaticanus manuscript is called uh, the Vatican manuscript because that's where it's kept. But it, too, is part of this uh, northern uh, North African uh, Egyptian uh, family. And the issue uh, with these three manuscripts is that Alexand uh, Alexandria in Egypt was kind of the origin and the, um, the focal point, the center, the base of operations of the Gnostics uh, at kind of the end of the first century, at the, about the same time that the, uh, uh, the New Testament books were being written. Uh, one of the things that you notice is that an awful lot of, no, not an awful lot, some verses from the majority text are left out of these, uh, mainly these three. I'm not going to pay much attention to the Ephraim uh, manuscript. Ephraim's interesting for a different reason. We'll talk about that when we come to it. 
Uh, but these, uh, these African, these Alexandrian uh, manuscripts uh, have Gnostic influences, and so they kind of strategically left out some of the Bible passages that are in your King James or New King James uh, version. Uh, if you read one of the modern translations like the NIV or the ESV, uh, you might notice that uh, some of the verses are, uh, are left out. And um, um, uh, so, uh, you know, that's something to keep in mind. Even when we consider that, just about any legitimate English Bible that you read is, is going to be 99%, even, even greater than that, uh, percent accurate. And uh, you would be hard pressed to find the differences uh, between the English Bibles based on the majority text and the English Bibles based on, on these three um, uh, manuscripts. But I know them. And uh, I kind of know why uh, a lot of those um, uh, omissions uh, were made. And the way modern um, translation committees work is uh, the decision about whether to leave a verse or a word or something like that in the text or leave it out is if two out of three of these texts agree either on leaving it out or that it that it's original, that it's legit, and it should be left in. It's based on a two out of three, uh, you know, kind of deal, because these three disagree with each other, uh, whereas you just don't have that problem with the majority text. It's uh, pretty um, cut and dry, straightforward, and so forth. Um, the last thing I'll say about this is uh, we also have on this chart a list of some of the disciples of the disciples, uh, disciples of the Apostles. Uh, these are some of their students. Uh, Clement of Rome, I think is even mentioned in the Bible. Uh, Ignatius, Polycarp, Papias, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Tertullian, Origen, Eusebius, the great uh, historian uh, who during his lifetime wrote one of the earliest histories of the Christian church. Jerome, uh, who translated the um, uh, Greek uh, the Greek and Hebrew Bible into Latin. Um, what is that uh, Latin Bible uh, called? The Latin Vulgate is, is the name of it. And then we have St. Augustine, who was thought by many to be uh, one of the greatest theologians who ever lived. And admittedly, uh, he did some great stuff uh, during his lifetime. But Augustine uh, almost single-handedly invented uh, amillennialism, uh, invented a figurative or symbolic interpretation, particularly of uh, prophetic passages uh, in the Bible. So basically, uh, Augustine is the one who did away with the millennium for a large segment of uh, Christendom. So uh, the reformers were basically followers of uh, Augustine. Martin Luther was an Augustinian monk, so he followed the teachings of Augustine. And so that's why a lot of the um, uh, uh, Protestant denominations have lost the teaching on the millennium and uh, don't have much appreciation for Israel and the Jewish people and kind of the roots, the, you know, the, the Jewish roots of our, uh, of our uh, uh, Christian faith. So uh, that's kind of the history of the uh, Bible. I want to just give you uh, kind of a peek at uh, some of the uh, charts that we'll be using as we go through the Bible on one foot. Uh, almost all of these charts that you see on this page are from a book of charts um, called, uh, I'm not sure what the various books are. I think I'd have to look and see. Uh, the book of charts, most of which that we'll be using, are uh, by a uh, scholar named Alfred Thompson Ede, E-A-D-E. -E. Uh, he has written a book. I don't know if you can see the book. It's called The Expanded Panorama Bible Study Course, where uh, in paperback form, you can get uh, black and white versions of these uh, charts with all of his Bible study uh, material. If I've got a share here, I'm going to show it to you. This is my letter of permission from um, uh, the Oak Knoll Publishing uh, to use these charts. Um, it's, a, it's a family uh, publishing company, and I wrote for uh, permission to, uh, to do this. So I have permission to use uh, 
at least some of these charts uh, that I will be uh, using. Um, so uh, we'll be using a lot of these charts. They start with uh, uh, in the beginning, God. We will we will talk about Satan, his past, present, and future. Uh, because we're going to see that, um, uh, well, I'm not going to give it away. Uh, we'll talk about Satan, uh, because in the Garden of Eden, he is already a fallen uh, angel. So, uh, you know, in the very beginning, he, he's already fallen. So we'll talk about how that happened. Uh, here's the six days of creation. Uh, then we get into the dispensational stuff, the first uh, dispensation of innocence, conscience, human government, promise, law, uh, there are actually three charts on the uh, dispensation of law, uh, because um, uh, this is the first one uh, here, the second one, and then here is the third one, because it was such a lengthy period of time. It was 1,500 years long, and uh, of course, the law of, um, of Moses is still in effect for Jewish people who don't believe in Yeshua, but if they believe in him, they can be New Testament uh, people. Uh, this is a chart uh, also of the legal uh, thing uh, that, uh, takes, that takes up at the end of the Babylonian captivity when the Israelite people returned to their uh, homeland and, and rebuilt their country. Uh, then the right hand uh, period is the, uh, this is this, uh, the, the silent 400 uh, years that actually weren't so silent and covers the uh, rising and falling of three major empires, the uh, Grecian Empire, the, um, and the, um, uh, the, Maccab uh, the Maccabees. Uh, actually, the uh, Persians were still in charge when the people uh, returned to Israel, uh, followed by Greece, then the Maccabees, the Jewish revolt, and then the Roman Empire, which was the empire that was ruling uh, at the... Uh, at the time of uh, Jesus, uh, then uh, following that we have the um, uh, we have the uh, age of uh, grace, uh, which begins with the uh, church. I've actually left a chart off of this uh, display. I'll put it back in <laughs> uh, because it's a kind of an important one. It's the life and ministry of Jesus, uh, followed by the uh, uh, great uh, uh, tribulation. Uh, on this uh, chart that I that I'm showing here, uh, it shows the uh, age of the church uh, through the like 2,000 years, um, culminating with the millennial kingdom. Whoops, nope, I'm wrong. Uh, this is the church age, followed by the great tribulation, not the millennial kingdom, but the great tribulation. These I've made these charts so small they're hard for me to uh, read. So here we have the millennial kingdom and then the eternal perfect state. Uh, this chart right here is another one from uh, Tim LaHaye and Thomas Ice's book called Charting the End Times. Uh, it is a excellent presentation of Daniel's outline of the future and those uh, kingdoms that we talked about. There is another uh, pretty old book of uh, charts by a guy named Clarence Larkin. Uh, his book, Dispensational Truth, has a lot of uh, black and white uh, charts that are uh, very important and uh, significant. So uh, there are two other charts that I'll make you aware of. One is by a fellow named Finus Dake. He wrote the Dake, oh, what is it? Annotated Reference Bible mainly known as the Dake Study uh, Bible. Uh, I think it's a very good Bible. I, uh, it was required reading for me in graduate school, and uh, it has become my kind of go-to uh, study Bible. And uh, of course, it goes from uh, in the beginning to the eternal perfect state on just one uh, chart. Um, these charts come in all different uh, sizes. Uh, this is a picture of a very large one that uh, pretty much covers uh, a wall uh, in, in my house. Uh, there is another uh, chart very similar to the date chart by a guy named John Hall. I actually like some of his uh, drawings uh, better than uh, Dake's, so uh, he too uh, covers uh, from the beginning uh, to the eternal perfect state on uh, one kind of lengthy uh, chart and so forth. So uh, that is gonna bring us to the uh, end of this uh, introduction to the Bible on one foot. I hope after this uh, 
I hope after this lengthy presentation, you will be uh, most eager to, uh, you know, to join us for the uh, rest of our uh, studies. Uh, for our next lesson, we'll be talking about origins. Uh, Christians would call it creation, um, and non-believers and atheists would call it uh, origins. And uh, we're just going to kind of show, we're going to compare and contrast uh, the theory of evolution and modern science with uh, biblical truth and, and so forth. So we'll, we'll take a good hard uh, look at that. With that, let me give you the blessing and we'll uh, bring this to a close. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Hope we'll see you next time.